You're listening to an Airwave Media Podcast. I feel like who art ed? Try to spice it. Who art ed? Mr. Wood <laughs> art ed me. Yeah. Either way, it, 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 can be, it works on so many levels. I know. I thought it was a great start. Welcome to Who Arted, where we explore visual arts in the audio medium. I'm your host, Kyle Wood, and joining me today, I've got once again, friend of the pod, Jeff Arndt, the art teacher from Ranchview Elementary. Thanks for joining me. Thanks for having me. Um, I appreciate your taking time on a Saturday morning to, to record with me about Henri Matisse. It's funny, like Matisse was never one that really struck me when I was in school, but like the more I read about him, kind of the more... I'm getting into them. I think it's one where once you you really start looking at some of the works, I think a lot of younger students can connect with stylistically. So it, there's it's kind of interesting. And, and like you, similarly, same. Knew all about the works of art, a little yeah. bit about the artist, you know, and uh, just was like, okay. Yeah. And I mean, stylistically, it does look like... I can see where kids would relate to it. I mean, some of this does look like it was made by a little kid. And, like, I I appreciate that, you know? An artist who makes me feel accomplished. Like, I look at him and be, I'm like, I could do that. Well, you sound, yeah, <laughs> we get to the whole, when I when I go to a museum with, uh, with my in-laws and we're pointing fingers saying, well, why is this here? I could do that. Why is this, <laughs> why is this here? I could do that. <laughs> Well, especially when you consider like he was a a visual artist who was still producing stuff while he was going blind, you know, that later stuff. I, I really, I that just shows his dedication to the craft. But um, you know, it is it is an interesting little factoid that he continued continued producing visual arts even as he was losing his vision. But that's the end of his life. We'll start at the beginning. He was born December 31st, 1869. He was born in northern France, and I guess like his father was a successful businessman, a grain merchant. In 1887, he went to Paris. He was going to study law. He was working kind of in that arena. Um, I think he was like a clerk or something like along those lines. And then at age 20, he has appendicitis, which, you know, not really great even today, but back then a little bit more debilitating. And so his mom gave him a paint set that he could use. So he basically had something to do while he was bored, stuck in bed. And that was a fateful turn for him because Matisse described painting as finding a kind of paradise. And he decided to give up the safe, stable profession and a career in law to become an artist Shockingly enough, his father was not overly pleased with this change. Don't you feel like this is the story, right? Like this is this is the origin story for so many. This is this is the story for so many artists. Like this feels like I, I should have some sort of shorthand for like, you know, he was promising and then disappointed his parents and succeeded eventually anyways, you know? Yeah. Like I, I, re- and I think a lot of people can relate. Like I remember when I first started to love art, like in second grade, I remember learning about, it was like one of those art awareness things on Monet. And I was looking at it and I was like, I love that. I want to, I want to be a painter like Monet. And I remember my dad being like, I've seen your paintings. You're going to be poor. And yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah I was going to be a comic book artist uh, about, about the same age. That was it. Yeah, I went and I'm going to work for Marvel and uh, that's it. I'm set. (laughs) Yeah, I was I was going to be a doctor before I went before I (laughs) went into like studying arts and stuff like I was going to go the full I was, you know, academic scholarships and stuff going to totally different route changed my mind. Um, So you really are the Matisse. This is it. (laughs) (laughs) I I. (laughs) I actually, yeah, now that I think about it, there is a little bit of a parallel because I, I left the first college I was going to on a medical leave, and that's where I started playing music and then got into the visual arts and stuff like that. Well, for those uh, listening, I am pleased to say that I've met Kyle's father, and he was he's not disappointed in him, so we have a very nice... No, no, no. Here. That, that story, like, he very, very supportive. That not at all the impression I was trying to give there. Um, just very honest and funny also. 
Um, but back to Matisse. So like he was studying art. He decided and he didn't just lay in bed and think, well, painting's fun and easy. I'm going to be a painter. Like he studied that craft. In 1891, he went to art school in Paris. He studied at the Academy Julien under William Adolphe Borgero. My students will be so disappointed. I have a native French speaker who always reminds me that I cannot pronounce anything, but I believe it's Borgero. I thought um, you were going to take a drink of water when you said that or something. Yeah. So he, <laughs> he attended that school. And what I find interesting is studying under Borgero, if you're familiar with his work, um, he was like the antithesis of what I think of when I think of Matisse and the avant-garde. Borgero was like the academy come to life. I mean, he was a highly polished figurative painter, extremely dedicated to realism in his work. He was considered to be like the finest painter in the world, according to the academic community. And he was despised by the Impressionists who, you know, the Impressionists, 1891, that was the avant-garde. So Matisse is studying under this like formal, very, very formal painter, but he's influenced by artists like Manet and like so many Impressionists and Post-Impressionists. He really liked the Japanese woodcuts, and those were very popular at the time. Um, Japanese woodcuts have come up on several episodes talking about, you know, Van Gogh, Lautrec. I did an episode on Katsushika Hokusai. Um, and I, I think it, it's sort of important to understand, like, why this was so big. Um, at the end of the Edo period, like, Japan was still largely closed off as a country, but, like, the woodcuts started making their way into the world. Katsushika Hokusai, specifically, was probably the most famous of the artists of that era. Not necessarily because he was the best, although I would not at all dispute he was a great artist. But, like, he had he had distribution deals with people in Europe. Like part of what made his work so popular is that it was, it was there, you know, it was accessible to people, you know, it's mass marketing. You see something enough, you start to like it. It builds a fan base. Well, especially if it's coming from an area that's relatively closed off and there's not a lot coming out of that area for the rest of the world to, to appreciate and to see. Yeah. And that's exciting. It, it is exciting. And we, we see around that time, you know, there was a lot of, um, I would say, like, good intentioned but bad outcome, like, you know, love of anything that seemed foreign and oriental and, you know, cultural appropriation and all of that sort of stuff. Um, you know, you, you think of like the orient, the orientalist style and all of that sort of stuff that's you cringe now, but I think I do genuinely think people were looking at it as like, wow, there's this whole other culture and this whole other approach that I haven't seen before. And I want to see, you know, Yeah. at least that's the generous take I like to give it. No, uh, I, yeah. You mm -hmm. did a lot of great, um, you had a lot of good descriptors there, but I, I, I see that especially during that time period. Yeah. And then like one other, and this is like a total tangent, but I just, I recently learned this. And so I assume nobody else knows it. Um, and I just found this fascinating. Katsushika Hokusai, he worked quite a bit with his daughter, um, Katsushika Oi. And I guess like Oi was this like kind of affectionate, but also dismissive term. Like, you know, I think of like Oi as in like, Hey, you, you know, kind of thing. Um, and in Japan, it kind of has the same meaning. Um, but she took that name and she not only like learned printmaking from her dad, she also like contributed to his works, even signed his names on pieces, his name on pieces so that like there were hokusai pieces being made even after he died. So funny thing, I had heard a similar version of that. I don't know where. But when I was getting ready for this episode, I was reading that and I was like, oh, my goodness, I've heard something similar to that. Yeah. 
And I don't know. It's not necessarily that surprising. Well, well, I mean, we've had podcasts before where we've talked about male female representation and, um, you know, the successes that you have and you don't have just based alone on your gender. Yeah, and I think like it's it's kind of like you know she was a part of the family business. She was contributing to that, learning the craft from her father. And because he was the big name artist, he it was the more bankable name. So from like a pure business standpoint, it would make total sense to sign his name on works that you're producing from that same studio. You know, um, it's just it's just a weird thing. It's it's kind of like how, you know, when something comes out of a famous artist studio, they don't write the names of all the assistants on that work. You know, maybe they should, but we don't. Anyways, back to Matisse. Uh, one thing, like I said, I really want to emphasize is he was, although he came to painting relatively late, age 20, he decided to become an artist. He he put in the work. He went to art school. He's learning from all different artists from different parts of the world. He's traveling. 1896, he goes to visit a friend, painter John Russell, and he teaches Matisse about color, which comes in much, much later in his work. I mean, when I think of Matisse, I think of color. But Russell suggests that Matisse check out the work of a little-known artist, Vincent van Gogh. He actually gave Matisse one of van Gogh's drawings. Then in 1898, Camille Pissarro, another familiar name to a lot of people who know art history, Pissarro tells him, like, go to London, check out the works of Turner. Um, you know, he just keeps talking to these amazing artists who show him the work of other amazing artists, and he is soaking it all in. Um, he actually went into debt getting works from different artists he admired just to surround himself with the works of like Rodin, Van Gogh, uh, Cezanne. Um, and like, if you're going to go into debt for a collection, that's probably a pretty good one to have. Yeah. That's a great investment. You know? I mean like that, that has to be worth, you know, millions of dollars today. Like, um, He's like quince and tuppled his money on that one. I mean, and if you think about it too, if he's buying it purely for, you know, appreciation and helping him also develop his own, you know, path through life. And now he has this in, amazing collection on top of it. And he himself is on a path for greatness. It's just incredible. It's amazing. Yeah. So, I mean, the takeaway from that is, Surround yourself with great art. It will influence you positive ways. And, you know, if you hold on to it long enough, it might pay off financially. So then summer of 1905, this is, I think, one of those stories where we can point to some events that help to create a historical narrative. Matisse takes his family out of Paris to a small fishing village, um, Callier. Uh, he invited his friend, a young artist named Andre Durain, uh, to join him. And the two of them are like painting side by side all around the village all summer. Matisse is encouraging Durain to, to move away from natural colors. They applied paint straight out of the tube, very little mixing. They're putting together works with unusual color schemes. Like they're often focusing on like those complementary colors, those opposite colors, blue and orange, red and green, yellow and purple, putting those colors next to each other to heighten the contrast, make the colors seem brighter in comparison. So then in the fall of 1905, they show their work at the salon and a critic gave a name to this new movement. I, I love this, this story, this, you know, whether we want to call it some kind of folk story one that's been amplified through the ages or something like this, but this, this buildup is phenomenal. Yeah. And I mean, so the name he gave it is Fauvism. Now the term Fauvism came from, as I said, a French critic, 1905, Louis Vosselet. He was at the salon and he sees this 15th century style sculpture surrounded by paintings of Matisse and Durain and Vosselet reportedly remarked, Donatello Amuel de Folle, 
I did not pronounce any of that. So even if you speak French, you probably have no idea what I said. But <laughs> what he said was Donatello among the wild beasts. He referred to them as wild beasts. He referred to Matisse and Dorain and their paintings as wild beasts. And just like the Impressionists, because the Impressionist movement named for Impression Sunrise, that was meant to be an insult, saying these were not real paintings, just impressions. The Fauvists, they took that term the critic used to insult their work and they transformed that meaning. They embraced it, saying, yes, we are wild. We are bold. And they were considered wild because of their bold use of color. The Fauvist style was sort of an extension of that post-Impressionist movement, further flattening the images, making things more abstract, bolder colors, more expressive, that painterly style. When I talk about painterly style, I you know, I know you know this, but just for audience perspective, when we talk about things being painterly, we're talking about seeing that process of painting, visible brush strokes and all of that. So I think that leads us into what many consider to be one of Matisse's greatest masterpieces, the work we're discussing this week, The Dessert, Harmony in Red, or sometimes referred to as The Red Room from 1908. So I I have been monopolizing the discourse so far. What do you what do you think of this? Well, I think it's beautiful. And one of the one of the things I appreciate most of this is when you go back and think about this history that you that you've spoken about, and you go all the way back to to a life-changing moment in your 20s, studying, you know, with a, a prestigious artist. And then becoming friends with, with all of these other renowned artists who have drastically different styles from your, your mentor or your, you know, your professor or whatever you'd like to call it. You can look at this, this beautiful piece of artwork and you can see this unfolding in it. And you can see all of these different influences coming through it. And then also an identity of his own. On top of that, and it's, it's yeah. amazing. I love this narrative, as I said before, and you can see it all unfold into this into this piece. I can see how it can be viewed as shocking um, with the different styles that you see, the colors that you see as well, too. I mean, there's, there's lots to absorb and to think about. Um, particularly, I can see how critics might call it wild, but also be dismissive of the quality of the work. Yeah, I mean, and the wildness, the, the first thing that jumps out to me, obviously, is that shock of red. I mean, that is just so much of that bold. It looks to me like a cadmium red um, that just like it, it's like burning my retinas as I look at it. And I believe like initial drafts of it he was thinking it would be blues but like he he chose the the red instead and i think that was a bold choice but the right choice for this and the, um, the contrast with the pattern running through not only the tablecloth but on the you know the wallpaper the patterns that you see on the wall how it carries you visually through it but then these wild you know curved shapes and it, it's amazing yeah, I mean, he's giving us he's giving us just enough so that we can make sense of this space on close inspection. Like we can see the woman is standing behind the table. There's that overlap that creates a sense of depth. Just like we see either we see out the window or we see the edge of like a painting hanging on the wall. But um like the from a distance, the patterning as you said, the wallpaper pattern is effectively the same as the pattern draped on the tablecloth. And so those two run together. From a distance, you don't really see a difference. And so it's like this woman kind of floating in this abstracted, decorative space. Um, and I, I find that really... It's kind of interesting, the way he's playing around with things and, and clearly consciously and deliberately breaking the rules... Yeah, it's like visually, there's like just enough to kind of keep it like spatially together. I mean, if you if you look at this work and you look at kind of the bottom area of it, you kind of lose your your 
your plane all together where the tablecloth and the wall just kind of melt. And then it's like a random chair that kind of gives you the rest of the space, assuming that you're okay. Here's where the ground is. Yeah. And that all that, that cadmium red just kind of all just kind of soaks that in. It's like just enough to keep it together. Yeah. And, and the fact that it's just enough to barely hold it together, I feel like creates this tension in me that like, I, I'm looking at it and it's like, this seems unsustainable. And yet the the flowing kind of organic shapes and the smooth curves, like there's a gentleness to it, um, which again is in tension with that, like it's barely held together. Things are floating cha- a little bit chaotic, a little bit breaking the rules, a little bit wild. Um, and then I, I also find that like, as I'm looking at this, that chair, that feels like Van Gogh's chair. Mm-hmm. Can you me. not picture that in the bedroom? Um, and, and I feel like, I don't know, I don't know necessarily if this was just like, well, it was popular to have those woven bottom chairs, but I, I think more likely it was Matisse referencing another artist like there are parts of this that feel there are parts of this that feel a little van gogh parts that feel a little Cezanne. yes you know with the when i look at the the layout of the i mean i'm gonna call it a still life but yeah the, the, the different fruits the fruit sitting out there i mean yeah and that's kind of where i go back to thinking about that that life narrative in this masterpiece and how all those pieces kind of fit in together to, to lead you here. Yeah. And as I said, there's also like that, that Japanese influence. This was the time of the Yukioi prints being really popular images from the floating world. And this has this floating kind of quality to it. You know, it's that domestic life. That's a little bit like, you know, we're, we're setting the table for a nice, a nice dinner or, you know, a, a luncheon or something like that, you know? I think if I, you know, when I think of my students, so another thing that's just remarkable with this thinking about Matisse's, you know, studying that he did and all of the work that he put into, to becoming an artist. But then I look at this and I think, wow, look at the connections between so much folk art that I've seen. And I think of artists that haven't, you know, been formally trained. And that to me is so interesting to think of the, the association or the label of being called a, you know, a fauvist, you know, wild beast. And then you have these trained artists that are so renowned producing this artwork, but then at the same time, it, it has that wild beast look, if you want to even say that, where they look like they're not trained and they're just doing these things. And I can see how that created such a reaction. Yeah. It, it is really interesting to think of, uh, you know, the wild beast having been, having studied under the academic painters, academic painter. You know what I mean? I mean, like that's, that's an interesting juxtaposition to me, but Again, it was it was an artist who clearly loved art and was taking in all of these inspirations from other just brilliant artists. And I, I, I think, you know, sometimes when I say like, oh, that chair looks like Van Gogh and the the fruit laid out and the slight tilt of the plane and stuff like that feels a little Cezanne and the, you know, the the floating quality feels like the Japanese UKOE influence and, you know, the the pleasures of daily life as they're setting the table for this, you know, nice dessert and all of that. Like to to talk about like he's taking elements from all these different things. In some ways, people might sometimes say like, well, he's just copying other people's styles and he's appropriating other people's styles. But the way what I that's actually what I really like about it is he it takes skill to recognize what's a good thing to take in and to mash things up in a new and interesting way. You know, as I look at this, what I really love about it is 
it's an art lover who is taking all of the things that he can learn from others and mashing those things up to create something new and bold and innovative and push his medium even further than other people had done. Um, and I think that's like the true story of art. It's not the solitary visionary. It's the person who learns from what's come before and makes these incremental steps um, to go further. Yeah, that inspiration causes, you know, new paths and a new inspiration for others. And that carries it through time. Yeah. Um, anything else you want to say about this piece? Yeah, one last thing. Up until this point, I mean, I've seen this piece quite a few times. I had never once ever thought of that being a painting on the wall. And now I'm completely second guessing myself <laughs> between is that a window or is that a painting on the wall? And <laughs> I can't stop thinking about it. <laughs> I I have only read about it being referred to as a window. But at the same time, like if you think about the context and the setting, this was made to be like a decorative panel to go into somebody's um, into like a dining room in like a Russian mansion or something like that. Like it was made to be in somebody's dining room as a decorative piece. And in something where he is being playful with the like the separation between the the wall and the tablecloth and all of that running together, doesn't it feel like he's getting very meta and it would make perfect sense to have like a painting within the painting? Yes. I mean, I, I feel like I might need to stare at this another hour or two and just kind of obsess over it because I just can't stop thinking about it now. Yeah. Um, but like I said, I, I, I think I'm, I think I'm a little bit of an outlier in that interpretation of it, but I don't know. Matisse is dead. He's not going to come back and say I'm wrong, so I'm sticking with it. We'll let the listeners decide. (laughs) I'm wrapping it up. I want just a three-point rating scale. And where should this hang? The Louvre? Is this something to look at? The lab? lab. Is this something to learn from? Or the Louvre? British for the bathroom. Yeah, there's a the loot joke in there somewhere. Yeah. Oh, that's terrible. Uh, for me, this is the Louvre. This is a brilliant piece of work. Yeah, I, I, I would have to agree. I feel like this is absolutely a museum piece. There's just so much going on. And the fact that we can not only study it and learn from it, but it's just, it's enjoyable to look at. And maybe that's my own personal biases and aesthetics of just like I love color I love bright bold colors I love things that are shocking but also playful I like that there's more to investigate and that to me is what museum pieces are all about and I love seeing the the influences the inspiration that then takes you to this point and how that helps you develop yourself as an artist yeah that is Yeah, and I I feel like Matisse is one of those people that, you know, his is a story that I absolutely love because I love that idea of an artist who was so captivated by the artwork around him that once he started creating, he had to collect, he had to learn all he could, and he could not stop himself. Um, As we alluded to earlier, uh, you know, he he kept working even when his vision was failing him. He started to make paper cutouts so that like he could still be creating visual arts, even if he couldn't see to apply the paint so well. He could feel the contours of the papers and all of that sort of stuff. And like that to me is so inspiring. I hope I'm that old guy who keeps finding a way to persist for the love of creating. Yeah. That is this that's inspirational to see somebody so just in love and devoted to what they do that they'll find a way to do it. Well, uh, thank you very much for taking the time. As always, I really appreciate your coming in, even despite the fact that it's a Saturday morning and my lights went out. So I can only imagine how creepy it is for you looking at just the black disembodied voice over Zoom. Um, thank you very much. I really appreciate it. I appreciate you letting me come on and ramble on for a little bit. It's always a pleasure. (laughs)
<laughs> Seriously, I, I just now I'm seeing on my screen. It's like I'm guessing you can only see the reflection on my glasses. So it's like just like glowing eyes coming out of the darkness. <laughs> it's gotten darker for whatever reason <laughs> over over the, the course of this. And I haven't quite been able to figure that out. At first, I could still see you for a while. And then it's just kind of like a little reflection of your glasses. And it's, <laughs> it's slightly terrifying. So yeah, it woke me up. <laughs> well, I I appreciate it. Thank you very much. Anytime. This concludes this week's episode of Who Arted. If you found this tolerable, please like and subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you're listening. You can find images of the work being discussed this week and every week in the show notes on Twitter at WoodArtEd and on the website whoartedpodcast.com. Podcast done.